Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the, not the homestead. Um, we usually do everything around the house, and today we're actually on a job site. We're, we're wiring a residential house here in central Maine. Um, as I've mentioned in the previous videos with the service entrance, we are licensed electricians, so this is not intended to be a tutorial. Um, this is for amusement purposes only for you guys. Um, we're just bringing you along. We're showing you some of the things that we run into as we do these projects, uh, telling you some of the things to look for, and kind of you know explaining some of the rules, if you will. Um, one of the big things that you run into um, and on this particular homeowner was great. Uh, before we was even ready for electrical, we already had our kitchen plans. And this is important because if you don't have your kitchen plans, you don't know where the refrigerator goes. You don't know where things go. You can guess there's going to be a sink here. But it's important. And why it's important is because there's these things like dedicated circuits. So the National Electrical Code dictates a lot of what we do. And one of the interesting facts is this is a fairly smallish kitchen, you know, in comparison to a lot of large houses and large kitchens. And in this particular kitchen, it spans 108 inches this way and about 8 feet this way. We actually need three 20 amp branch circuits. NEC requires we have a dedicated receptacle for the refrigerator and two circuits for the kitchen. So we'll run three circuits for that. Of course, they all have to be GFCI except for the refrigerator. Um, GFCI, AFCI, that's a whole fun one. Um, this is a little map showing per code cycle what rooms have to be AFCI or GFCI or both. Um, again, we're not really here to tell you how to do this. We're just showing you some of the stuff that we run into. So the first thing we do when we get to a job site like this is we meet with the homeowner. We walk around, we find out what that homeowner may want for lighting, uh, fans, different things, convenience receptacles in, in what we would consider out of the normal locations. Uh, what I mean by that is National Electrical Code tells us that we cannot have any receptacle on a wall that cannot be reached by a six foot cord. Um, I probably didn't say that correctly. The way the code reads is if we draw a device right here on the floor with a six foot cord, it needs to be able to reach a receptacle. So the maximum spacing between receptacles in a regular area is 12 feet. Six feet within the start of a wall. So if you spin around and look at this wall over here, there's a front door. Within six feet of the front door, we have to have a receptacle. If the wall is just a, just, let's say there was a wall right here, just on the wall, for some reason there's a piece of wall right here, it doesn't connect to anything. If that wall is 24 inches or less, it doesn't need a receptacle. If it's 25 inches or more, it follows those rules of receptacles. So that's something to keep in mind. Another one is hallways. So this particular hallway right here is less than 10 feet long. So by code, we do not need a receptacle in this hallway. But the homeowner would like to have one here, so we will put one in. Um, some of the other things that you have to think about when you're roughing in a house before sheetrock, uh, who's responsible for thermostat wiring? If there's going to be a heating or air conditioning system and there needs to be thermostat wired pulled, usually the HVAC guys do that, but every now and then it's a gray area. Should the electrician pull it? Should they pull it? Or if you're building your own house, and that's what the purpose of this video really is. If you're building your own house and you're homesteading and you're wanting to do this all yourself, you are allowed in most states to do your own electrical work. Some states require it to be inspected. I think there are some states where you cannot do it at all. Maine, for example, you can do 100% of your own electrical work. It just has to be inspected by, you know, the local authority or a licensed electrician. So that's what we're trying to show you here, some of those things that you want to think about before the drywall goes up and that way you're not coming back and be like, Wow, I forgot all about that. How do I deal with that? Uh, another thing we like to do, um, this is a bedroom. Re you know, regular 12 by 12 bedroom. We know there's a ceiling fan going in here in the center of the room. So when we wire houses with ceiling fans, we always put two switches and we run three conductor up to the ceiling fan. And that way you're not having to pull chains on the ceiling fan if you don't want. You have one for your light and one for your fan. The other thing you'll notice is I have to come back around here. These boxes, when you hit that nail, if you pull the nail up a little bit, you'll see how that box is folded up a little bit in the middle. Just tap that with your hammer and that box will straighten right out. So what you want to do before the drywall goes up, you want to go around and make sure all your boxes are through. If you have more than a two gain box, like here, we have a three gain box. You'll see how it's a little floppy. 
It has this wing on it to go up against the drywall. What we're going to end up doing is we're going to put a block of two by four in here and hold that up where it needs to be and just make sure it's level. You see how easy that is? The drywall guys could come in and deform it like that. I mean, that's just one finger pushing down on that box, right? And then when I come back to put my devices in, there's no way I'm going to get the cover straight and make it look good. So we're going to mount that. Um, we have a bunch of recessed light fixtures going in here. We know where those are going. The homeowner's drawn us a really nice map of where they want those and how they want those controlled. Those are the things to think about. Is that it, it doesn't cost a lot to put in extra uh, switches. So in this case, for example, in the living room, we have two different sets of recessed lights and a ceiling fan. So we've got two separate switches for both sets of recessed lights. So if they're watching TV, they can turn both off. If they're reading, they can turn the ones on the couch on, whatever they want to do. Um, the big thing that I want to point out during this video is traffic flow. So it's easy to sit there and think like, I can walk to my bedroom in the dark. I don't really need to worry about that. But you want to think logically, like I'm coming home at night, I'm walking in my front door, I want to turn on an area light. Yeah, and in this case, it's going to be the ceiling fan right here. We turn on that light in the ceiling fan from here. Then like we're tired, we're just going to bed. We get over here, we have a switch for the stairwell, and then we have a switch for our living room light. So we can shut that light back off. So we, we don't have to like come over here and turn the stairwell light on and go back over there and turn the living room light off. We can flow right through the house and never have to back up. The, the, a good electrical design will have you walking straight through the house. You shouldn't have to keep going back and forth to turn switches on and off. That's something to pay attention to. Um, we're running all 12-2 in this house for receptacles. You can run 14-2 as well. The, the rules on how many receptacles per circuit are really all over the place, depending on who you talk to, what you read. I believe if you read NEC, you're going to find that it says you should count each receptacle as 1.5 amps. So a 20 amp circuit is good for 80% of that, which is 16 amps. So that's about 10 receptacles is the recommendation. Of course, if you know you're not plugging anything heavy, you can go a little farther. You can go a little lighter if you're plugging in something heavy. You know, there's a lot of different things you can do there. In this case, the homeowner has a, a nice small Honda inverter generator that he uses when the power is out. And we're going to actually put in a small two pole uh, transfer switch made by midnight. Real, you know, affordable piece of gear. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a, a single receptacle on the outside of the house, generator plug-in receptacle. So it'll be a male uh, 120 volt receptacle. We're gonna hook that transfer switch up down in the basement so he can pick two of his circuits in his house. Um, one which will be his flat panel heaters that draw about 500 watts. And the other one I think is gonna be his refrigerator. And we'll put that on that transfer switch so that he can plug that little suitcase generator in and turn that on from the grid, uh, off when you're off the grid. So yeah, we're, uh, those are some of the things I can think of right now. Um, another thing that I'll point out is, let me not move the boxes. So you'll notice there's boxes everywhere. What we did this morning is we met with the homeowner and instead of having him draw, write, whatever, I said, hey, here's the boxes. Just put one every place you want a receptacle. And that way he's covered. If I notice he didn't put enough, I can expand on that, but it's exactly where he wants it. But on these boxes, you'll see there's a, uh, a little piece here. And essentially, if Sue spins around, I'll see if we have enough light to show you this without being washed out in the window. But if you just slide them up against the stud like that, that leaves you about a half inch of space right here. So when you're doing this, one of the things you need to know is the wall covering. Because if the box sticks out too far, then your cover won't go up tight against the wall and it looks really crappy. If your box is in too far, then you run into some code issues and loose receptacles. So if you've ever gone in a house, you've plugged your, your cord in and the receptacle moves around in the wall, that's because it's not clamped up tight against the box or the wall. So ideally we want this basically flush with the drywall. In this case, it's half inch drywall. If you were doing like a wainscoting down here on top of the drywall, we can put box spacers on or we can leave the box out that far. But you, you kind of want to know what thickness the wall covering is going to be to put your box on. Get them mounted. We'll show you some tricks and secrets when we start pulling wire. Um, but we've talked about the kitchen needing two different 20 amp circuits. And the reason behind that is everybody has these real powerful appliances in the kitchen. And we just want more than one circuit, so we want nuisance tripping breakers. Bathrooms, I like to do 
each bathroom on its own circuit just because hair dryers and stuff are getting pretty large nowadays. I tend to do a lot of my lighting on their own circuits as well, uh, just to isolate things from things. Just really boils down to what your personal preference is there and how you know frugal you're trying to be on wire. The one other big thing, and I'm not going to even begin to try to explain placement for you, um, other than just tell you that read, 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 read the code book, understand what's going on about smoke detectors. You most definitely want to wire for smoke detectors now. Uh, we are going to put, you know, one in every bedroom, one in the hallways, yada, yada, yada. We're going to put them in the basement. We'll probably entertain them with the garage in the future. But when you run, what you need to know for now is you want to use your octagon boxes. Don't know why they're called octagon, because they're round. Actually, I do know why they're called octagon. I could probably show you that. Um, in, in the original days, we used metal boxes. And they were multi-sided. Octagon. Anyways, this is what would be called an octagon nail-on box. Round box. You're going to want to put one of those every place you want a smoke detector. You're going to want to run 14.3 not 14.2 or 12.3, not 12.2. You need a third conductor. You need a hot conductor to run your 120 volts AC and then you need another hot conductor to run the signal between the interconnected smoke detectors. In our case, we're gonna use 14.3. We'll run 14.3 all the way back to the electrical panel and that way, if we wanna run another one in the garage later, we can feed it from the electrical panel and we don't have to get back in one of these boxes and we still have the trigger. We'll just cap the red wire in the electrical panel unless we wanna use it in the future. So those are things to think about. Um, outside receptacles, make sure you get those in where you want them. Plenty of them. The other thing is lights outside a door. This is one of those things that's easy to forget as you're going. In our case, we're putting one on each side of this door. And the normal average run-of-the-mill light, general rule of thumb is 10 to 12 inches out from the door and 10 to 12 inches down from the door and you make a mark and that's where you poke your wire out through. Um, if you were doing say vinyl siding or something different, you know, you want to look at what your customer is doing for lights, you want to know what you're doing, you may want to adjust that a little bit to meet something in the siding. Like if you're doing a hardy plank cement siding, you may want that wire to come out in the center of the board instead of on one of the seams. So just things to be aware of. And then the other thing, We'll point out a lot of the trips and tricks on the actual pulling of wire when we get to that phase. I think we've covered most everything from a, you know, what do we need to think about when we're roughing in a house standpoint. Get your bathroom fan ventilation put in. Uh, that's another one that if you're building the house yourself, of course you're doing it all yourself, you're going to do it all. Uh, but you need to know who's in charge of getting the ventilation run out through the side of the house. Is that you, the electrician, or is that the plumber, you know, or the contractor, etc. So, I think that's about it. I think we're going to go ahead and mount a few boxes. Sue will probably uh, bring the camera along while we mount a couple boxes in, the, in this bedroom. And we'll wrap this video up, and we'll bring you back when we start pulling wire. How's that? So, any questions, leave them down below. Um, we may interject some wiring diagrams for three, um, yeah, three phase. No, we're not doing three phase. This is a split phase dwelling. Uh, three way switches, three and four way switches. We may do a whole video on that because that seems to be really uh, a mystery to a lot of people, but it's actually pretty simple once you understand it and you think about it as water flow. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to start nailing some boxes on. We'll wrap this video up and we'll bring you back when we start pulling wires. So don't forget to like and subscribe. So what we've done is Sue's actually going ahead of me and she's making a mark at 18 inches off the floor. This mark is really personal preference. You know, you can be quite high, quite low, but that's what we're doing here. And I'm coming back. And mounting our boxes. So we'll go through the whole house like this. We'll get all of our boxes mounted. We'll define all of our lighting circuits. And then we're going to design our circuits and decide where we want to go um, and what, where the home runs are going to come from. And we'll lay that out. We'll drill a bunch of holes and then you'll get to watch Sue pull a whole lot of wire.